Well, welcome everyone to our service this morning. We have returned to the before time when we are um, recording for Sunday morning with nobody here in the sanctuary. Sad that it's come so soon before Christmas, but that is our reality here in our province. So um, the office is going to be closed for the next four weeks um, per the kind of mandate from um, Alberta. Um, and we will not be having in-person worship services until after the beginning of the new year. Um, but check your emails, check online all of our social media to find out the times and such of our um, Christmas Eve service will still be going on. And the um, prompt for you to log on to YouTube will also be um, sent to you in the email. So don't forget to look at that so you can look at our worship services. Um, because the office is closed, you can still drop off your, your gifts, monetary gifts. You can put them through the slot in the staff door at church. Or if you want to use the debit machine, that if you would just call the church office and we'll make sure somebody comes down here to meet you so that you can do that. So I think those are the, the pieces of, of what we were doing before um, September of how we are operating for ch operating church. So um, it's a challenging time for all of us. There's no um, getting around that. Um, we would want to be in person. We'd want everybody to be here for the rest of Advent and Christmas Eve, but it's not going to happen. So we just encourage you to check us out online. And if you've been doing that all along, we welcome you back to that as we will all be joining together. So let us gather together online as the family of God, and let us worship God on this third Sunday in Advent. What child is this who to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring in love the babe, the Son of Mary.
O come, all ye faithful, <laughs> joyful, and triumphant. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. In this well-known and beloved Christmas hymn, we are invited as God's faithful people to go to Bethlehem and adore Christ the Lord. We sing words borrowed from the Nicene Creed to express the Christian faith about the Incarnation. After exhorting the angels to sing their praise, we greet Christ on his birthday. There is a sense of urgency to this hymn. Imagine someone dragging you by the hand as you run through a crowd, saying over and over again, Come! We are told that patience is a virtue, but who could stand by and wait when all we want to do is worship our Lord and Savior? This hymn takes us by the hand and leads us with triumph song to Bethlehem, show us the infant Jesus, and invites us to sing with the angels, sing with our families, sing with our fellow believers, sing with every fiber of our being, and worship Christ the Lord. As we light this third candle of Advent, let us remember who this baby in a manger really is. He is God of God, light of light eternal, Son of the Father, Word of the Father in flesh, and Christ the Lord. We continue this morning in our series on the songs of Christmas, looking at the song, O Come, All Ye Faithful. It's maybe one that all of us know. It's one I certainly knew growing up in the church. And as I said in my video this week, it was a song I remember from a Christmas album we would play as we decorated the church, where Bing Crosby would sing, mixing in the Latin text of this song as well. But may our hearts be open as we hear the word of God um, spoken this morning, that those words would become new to us as we hear them in the context of Hebrews 1. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day, for this time we have to lift up your, your amazing name, 
and to open up our hearts to the words that you would have us hear this morning. Bring us joy. Bring us um, hope. Even in these dark days. Because we know that you are with us. And that these words affirm the power and the glory of your son, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go on Sankofa, which is the Covenant Church's journey of racial rec uh, reconciliation. It was a powerful uh, trip. I think I've shared a little of that before with you and learning about things I thought I knew about slavery and reconstruction and incarceration, mass incarceration in the United States was a, an incredible, powerful learning experience for me. The last stop on our trip was Memphis, Tennessee, where um, we went to the Civil Rights Museum, which is housed in the Lorraine Motel, which was the place where Martin Luther King was assassinated. We also went around Memphis and saw some other parts and of, that are part of the civil rights story. And we ended up at a small kind of nondescript house a couple blocks away from the Mississippi River. And uh, as we got to that place, an older woman, African-American woman, came onto our bus. And she was someone who had marched at Selma um, and participated in the civil rights movement. And she told us about this place that we were going to be at, this small, very nondescript house that had become a museum because it was a stop on the Underground Railroad, because it was so close to the Mississippi. The slaves who had, had come up the river could, through the dark of night, come into that house and begin their journey to freedom. One place that was not on our trip but would be interesting to go to was that in, in Mount Macomb, Georgia, where the Harriet Tubman African American Museum is located, the museum honors Tubman, and if you know who she was, she was called the Black Moses because of her work as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She was a, a runaway slave herself, and she returned again and again to the South to rescue her family and other slaves. She made 19 trips into the South and escorted more than 30, 300 slaves to freedom. At great personal risk to herself, she blazed a trail to freedom for many who had been caught in the life of slavery. As we continue this morning on our Advent journey, we turn to the book of Hebrews, which I have to admit is a text I've never preached for in all of the many Advents that I have preached. In Hebrews 2, which is a, a part of the larger text that we're not going to look at this morning, the writer of Hebrews says this, God is the one who made all things, and all things are for his glory. He wanted to have many children share his glory, so he made the one who leads people to salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus, like Tubman, led people out of slavery to sin by his death on the cross, giving us freedom to live full and abundant lives for Jesus. And it is our relationship with Jesus, the one who draws us to freedom out of slavery to sin, who allows us to share in his glory. This idea of, of sharing in Jesus' glory is an idea that we find in our text for this morning. These verses give us a glimpse of Jesus, not just the Jesus who walked on earth and, and spent time with his disciples and taught with authority, but Jesus, the glorious one, through whom God spoke to the world. You have your Bibles with you, or it will be on the slide as well this morning. We read in the very first part of Hebrews. 
the writer says this, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors, to the prophets, many times and in many different ways. But now in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. God has chosen his son to own all things and through them, through him, he made the world. The sun reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like. He holds everything together with his powerful word. And when the sun made people clean from their sins, he sat down at the right side of God, the great one in heaven. The sun became much greater than the angels and God gave him a name that is much greater than, our, than theirs. This is because God never said to any of the angels, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Nor did God say of any angel, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when God brings his firstborn son into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. The book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians to show the, the superiority of Jesus over the prophets and Moses and the priests and the whole Old Testament system. Jesus is revealed to be a new priest, representing a new sacrifice that establishes a new covenant between all people, not just between the Jews and God, but between all people. The author presents this, his argument using Greek thought which says that somewhere beyond our world is a real world, that this world is only a shadow, uh, and we get just an inkling of what that perfect world is like. The Greeks were haunted by the fact that in this life, we can only guess and grope. It's as if somewhere beyond our existence, is a real chair, a, a perfect chair, that all other chairs in the world are imperfect copies. What we see in our world is a kind of imperfect shadow chair, but in that world that we cannot see, that perfect world, there exists a real and perfect chair. The Jews, who were the intended audience, of Hebrews had a lifetime of ritual that shaped their lives and worship. But what they experienced in their life through those rituals was only a shadow chair, not that real and perfect chair. Their obedience to those rituals shaped their lives and it helped them to feel accepted by God. So the writer of Hebrews tells them, all your life, you have been looking for reality beyond the shadows, for the real thing in the midst of all of your rituals. But the truth is this, that the real thing, the perfect thing, has been underneath your noses the whole time in the person of Jesus Christ. As the writer of Hebrew lays out, Jesus was the one who had lived among them, who had died for them, the perfect priest, the perfect sacrifice, the one who had come to draw them out of the shadows to show them the real thing, the new covenant in the person of Jesus Christ. In these opening verses of Hebrews, we see Jesus described as the real and perfect chair, the God who the Jews had only known in shadow. But now in Jesus, they would know face to face. Oh, come, all ye faithful ones of God. Our passage seems to really yell out to us and hear the uh, astounding an amazing truth about Jesus and see how real and perfect he really is. The writer of Hebrews 
tells us that it is through Jesus that God speaks to us. In the very first verse of our passage, we read that God has spoken many times and in many ways. In fact, if we go back to the very beginning of the Bible, in chapter 1 of Genesis, we see that our God is a speaking God. In verse 3 of chapter 1, it's the first time we read this when we, when we read that, then God said. Not God did or, or God thought, but this is what God said. God's word, the, the, the very words that came out of his mouth brought everything into being. From the tiniest particle to the largest mountain, all creation, all the good and excellent and amazing creation, all that came into being through the words that God spoke. In the beginning, God spoke through creation. But then as we read through the Old Testament, we saw that God spoke to his creation. First to Adam and Eve, and then Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and Moses and Joshua and Deborah and David and Isaiah and Malachi, through many different people, men and women, leaders, judges, kings, prophets, God spoke his will, his plans, his purposes to his created and much-loved people. God spoke because God had something to say to his creation, to shape and form them in the people he desired them to be. But when God's creation stopped listening, God changed his tactics, and he decided to speak through another one, his very son, Jesus, who in the Gospel of John we read that this Jesus was the Word made flesh. He was the Word personified. In 1971, Ray Tomlinson was experienced with ways, uh, experimenting with ways that people's computers could interact with one another. So he sent a message from one network computer to another network computer making him the first one to send an email. Decades later, billions of emails go out every single moment of the day and appear in inboxes around the world from family and friends and businesses and all kinds of places. But even unwanted viruses, destructive viruses, can be sent through email. So a basic rule is don't open your email unless you trust the sender. In these opening words of Hebrews, we are told to open our lives to Jesus because we can trust the sender. Because Jesus speaks for God. In fact, Jesus speaks the very words of God, which is in our song for this morning. Jesus, to you be all glory given. Word of the Father. Using those, the text from John 1, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. The Jesus born in Bethlehem is not just a human baby, but the very word of God, and also the glory of God in human flesh. We are told by the writer of Hebrews that Jesus reflects the glory of God and shows us exactly what God is like. In other words, Jesus is God in every way. The Greek word that is used here is character, and it means two things. It is a seal, and, and, and it's a, the impression that that seal makes when it is pressed into wax. My mom had a thing called a Chinese chop. 
which is on the picture there. And inscribed into the bottom of that jade chop is her name in Chinese characters. And it came with an ink pad, very similar to the one you see on the screen. And she would press her chop, her seal, into that red wax and then put it on books and papers that she had. And you knew what belonged to my mom because she had her chop, her, her seal imprinted on those things. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact imprint of God, meaning that Jesus is the exact image of God. Just as my mom's seal stamped out the exact image or imprint of her name in Chinese characters, so when you see Jesus, you see the very image of God. God's glory, God's power, God's creative energy, God's forgiveness, and God's love. All of that we see in Jesus. Jesus, the exact imprint of God, is greater, uh, the writer says, than even the angels which Paul tells us as well in Philippians 2. So God raised him to the highest place. God made his name greater than every other name so that every knee shall bow to the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and everyone confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The writer of Hebrews agrees with Paul and describes the amazing reality of who Jesus is with the words that seem to rush out of him like a great river tumbling over a waterfall. He says that Jesus reflects the glory of God. He shows exactly what God is like. He holds everything together with his powerful word. He made people clean from their sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, the great one in heaven, and he has become much greater than the angels. God gave him a name that is greater than theirs. Jesus is the glory of God in human flesh. There is no one in all of creation that is greater. And again, our song for this morning reflects that reality. Yes, Lord, we greet thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory given, Son of the Father, now in flesh, appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. We are called to worship this baby born in Bethlehem, who was at once fully God and fully human. The writer of Hebrews speaks a lot about angels in this book. Perhaps it is because angels and um, the idea of angels and the work of angels was very much a part of Jewish theology. And so in order to kind of help them understand that, that, that angels weren't the same as Jesus, they weren't on the same level as Jesus, they were part of God's created order. And so he uses some, some scripture from the Old Testament, from Psalms and 2 Samuel, to tell us that angels don't have the same relationship to God as Jesus does, and that when Jesus came into the world, the angels were told to worship him. If we read again and from Psalms 2 that it says that God never said any of this to the angels, that you are my son, today I have become your father. Or he didn't say to any angel, I will be his father and he will be my son. But when God brings Jesus into the world, he will say of him, let all God's angels worship him. Those quotes from the Old Testament develop this argument about the reality of who Jesus is. Perhaps in their culture, they hadn't fully grasped that, and so he addresses that issue with them, that their wrong understanding 
of angels was needed to be changed and straightened out. You see, angels are not divine beings that are the same as Jesus. They are only messengers of God. And they have been very important in the whole story of Jesus' birth. Think about Mary. When she was made known to her that she was to become the mother of Jesus, it was made known to her by an angel who came to visit her. And with her cousin Elizabeth, when it was made known to her that she was going to be um, the mother of the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah. Those were angels, messengers of God, giving that good news. And when that good news of Jesus' birth was heralded, it was by angels, two shepherds, who sent them on their way to Bethlehem with a joyful song and giving glory to God. The angels, the messengers of God, give glory not to Mary and Joseph for their place in God's redemptive story, but they sing a song of praise to God for what God did that night in Bethlehem when he gave us Jesus, the word made flesh. And the angels are commanded to sing God's glory, sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, glory in the highest. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Our passage this morning reminds us that when we see Jesus, we see God. Not a reflection of God, not a poor imitation of God, but God. With all of God's glory, with all of God's authority, yet a human being, just like us. And as humans, we share not only in Christ's humanity, but also in his glory which is almost too amazing for our minds to grasp. Our calling as God's created one is to share in the glory of that one born in Bethlehem who lived like one of us, who died for us, was raised to new life, and now sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, in forever and ever. And of those who love God, who have faith in the baby born in Bethlehem and believe that Jesus did come to die for our sins, that even in the midst of the challenges of life, and there have been many over the last nine months, and it seems like the challenges keep coming, that there's no end in sight. Yet in the face of those things, the song reminds us that we can be joyful and triumphant as faithful followers of Jesus. Sometimes the activities and traditions of Christmas can seem routine because we do them again and again every year. But Advent reminds us that a baby came into our world, and this was no ordinary baby. For if we experience the birth of Jesus at Christmas calmly or with a shrug, then we are missing how our world changed over 2,000 years ago. Think about it. The God of the universe sent his only son into our world, into our world. The, The word made flesh. The word who reflects the glory of God, who spoke for God and shows us exactly what God is like. If we believe the truth of that, if we base our lives on that reality, then we have nothing to fear, that there is no circumstance that we can't overcome because the God of the universe came near to us in Jesus, a baby born in Bethlehem. So let us give God all the glory and all the praise for what he has done for us in Jesus, 
O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Jesus, to thee be all glory given, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord God, the one who spoke creation into being, the one who continued to speak to your people down through the ages, We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. All of your glory, all of your power, all of your authority was in this one that came into our world. It is amazing for us to wonder that and ponder about that at this time of year. It's too easy, I think, to think of baby Jesus in a manger and consider that tiny baby is ineffective and not able to help us in our time of need. Yet, oh God, you sent your son as a vulnerable baby so that we might see you in human flesh. And so, God, as we continue our journey towards Bethlehem, may we remember who Jesus is, not just a baby lying in a manger, vulnerable and small, but a baby who is the very word of God, a word that can speak into the trouble we face. A word that can say to us as we are struggling perhaps with food and jobs and wondering how we're going to get through this holiday season. A word that says, peace, be still. Let God take control through his son, Jesus. Be not afraid. A word that says, yes, this is going to be a challenging Christmas season. Many of us will be cut off from family. That will be hard at Christmas. That is so much family-oriented. So the word made flesh. Speak to us words of peace and calm and hope that even though this time will be different and challenging and, yes, hard, you are the God who meets us through your Son in those times and spaces where we feel most alone. Come by us. Surround us with your love that we would not feel alone. And the word made flesh. Make the reality of Christmas real and true for us, that even as we cannot gather together to celebrate the coming of Jesus as a church body, we can still do that every single day in our life. May we remember your coming and what it means to us to be empowered, to be joined in relationship, that we have been set free from our sin, that we have been empowered by your resurrection to live full and abundant lives, even in the midst of a pandemic, which seems to take everything from us. For with you, the word made flesh, we have everything that we need. May we rest in you. May we trust in you. May we abide in your loving and eternal presence as we continue to walk 
this Advent way, nearing the manger. Thank you, O powerful God, for giving us your Son. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Hear this word of blessing. Christ has come in the past. He is coming today. And praise God, he is coming again at the end of time. So go into your week surrounded by the power and the presence and the peace of our coming King. Amen.